Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of the new taxonomy of lactobacillus. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Dr. Michael Gansla, professor, of, professor and Canada Research Chair in Food Microbiology and Probiotics at the University of Alberta, and Dr. Ben Wolf, Associate Professor at Tufts University. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. All right, Ben and Michael, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Amelia. And thank you everyone for coming out today for a really exciting webinar on a really important topic for fermentation. My name is Benjamin Wolf and I'm an associate professor at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts. And I'm on the advisory board of the Fermentation Association. And we put together this session and many other science sessions um, work together with Maria Marco at UC Davis. Um, so a big thanks to her for helping out with organizing these. Today, we're incredibly lucky to have uh, Michael with us today to talk about um, this renaming problem in a very important group of microbes, a bacteria uh, called lactobacillus. And uh, Michael is a professor uh, and Canada Research Chair, very prestigious honor uh, in Canada. And he's at the University of Alberta in the Department of Agricultural Food and Nutritional Science. And I feel incredibly honored to be here today because anytime I want to look up anything on fermented foods and lactobacillus or any lactic acid bacteria, I'll almost always land on a paper by Michael and his group. He's been doing research in this space for a long period of time um, when he was being trained in Europe and when he had his lab over in Europe. And then more recently, uh, since 2005, when he's been at the University of Alberta. And Michael's research focuses on fermented foods and the functions that bacteria, including lactic acid bacteria, play in fermented foods. But he's also interested in the probiotic properties of these bacteria and how they interact with our intestinal microbial ecology as well. So Michael's work really spans everything from farm and ferment to gut and, and really thinks about this from a, a big systems level perspective. And today he'll be telling us about this uh, recent initiative to rename and reorganize lactobacillus, this important fermented food group of bacteria. Um, so Michael, I'll let you take it away with a presentation. And then after the presentation, Michael and I will go back and forth with some questions before we open it up to the group for, for questions from you. Take it away, Michael. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, I'm presenting from Edmonton, Alberta, uh, and the disadvantage of the online seminars is uh, you can't enjoy the fresh snow cover that we got uh, yesterday for the first time of the year. Uh, I guess in most other places you will have to wait a little bit. Uh, in the presentation today, which I will aim to keep in about 30 minutes, uh, I will ask a simple question, what is a lactobacillus? Uh, briefly motivate why the taxonomic reclassification was necessary. Uh, I will have a brief flavor of the science without getting into too much detail and, until uh, I'm asked after the lecture uh, and try to have a few slides on what it all means uh, if you're using the organisms or selecting the organisms for food fermentations. Here. Um, if you look at the last month before the taxonomy was reorganized in March 2020, uh, at that time the genus Lactobacillus had 262 species, uh, give or take one or two that was uh, published at the end of the month. Uh, of these 262 species, 84 were on the list uh, of uh, the International Dairy Federation, which maintains an inventory of food cultures that occur in fermented foods. Uh, 20 of those were produced commercially as starter or probiotic cultures uh, and 37 species are on the QPS list of uh, the European Food Safety Authority and 12 on the FDA grass list. Uh, you 
often read that lactic acid bacteria are safe, uh, which is not quite the case, because if you look at lactic acid bacteria, uh, you have a couple of bad pathogens, but if you look at lactobacilli, uh, most or all lactobacilli have a safe history of use in food, uh, and very few of any species are related to rare reports of systemic infections in critically ill patients. It's a large genus. It's also an economically important genus, uh, which uh, is regulated in many country, cultures, uh, countries. Uh, what I want to do, uh, the erection might be of many. Uh, the new taxonomy is a pain uh, because no one has time to waste to learn 23 new names. Uh, but maybe I can convince you that uh, Moving the taxonomy is actually the best thing since the invention of sliced bread uh, because it does facilitate communication on all things which relate to lactobacillus. Uh, to illustrate that, uh, I can show the picture of this cute little lemur, uh, which I found in the newspaper not too long ago. Uh, if you were uh, working on lemurs uh, and you had a taxonomy which is equally screwed up as the lacto lactobacillus taxonomy was until March. Uh, you would go to your colleagues and tell them that you research human evolution and ecology. Why is that the case? Uh, if we look at the order uh, primates, uh, that includes Homo sapiens, uh, that's us. Uh, it also includes Neanderthals. Uh, that's a different species in the same genus. Uh, we pride ourselves of being somewhat different from the Neanderthals, although most of us actually carry a small proportion of Neanderthal genes. Uh, so that's still a fairly close relationship. Uh, if you go to the big apes, uh, orangutans, they're uh, in a different genus, but still in the same uh, family. Uh, and last but not least, lemurs would be a different family in the same order. Uh, so related to humans, but quite distantly related to humans. And obviously they look different, they have different habits uh, uh, and a very different ecology. Uh, how does that compare to the lactobacilli? Uh, again, that would, be, that would be the status before the reorganization. Uh, you can benchmark bacterial genera, families, and species with 16S and uh, average amino acid identity. Neither give you hard cutoffs, but they give you sort of an indication of how much the organisms are related. Uh, the species would be highly related organisms with uh, proteins being more than 97% identical. Uh, species in the same genus, uh, depending on uh, which genus you're looking at, the AI range can cover more than 60 to more than 90 percent. Uh, and at the family level, you go to uh, 60 down to 60 to 75 percent average amino acid identity of the core genome. The lactobacilli uh, until March were somewhere here, uh, which means two species in the same genus were as closely related. Uh, as two species in the same order in other places of uh, bacterial taxonomy, or uh, getting back to the example that I used previously, you use the same genus name for different species, uh, for, for very different organisms. And if you're talking about lemurs, you talk about human evolution and ecology, because you're simply lacking the words to uh, do it proper. <clears throat> so. Lactobacilli are, they can be cocktail rods, they can respire or not. Uh, they have two very different metabolic pathway. Uh, some of them grow in the fridge. Some of, some of them grow up to 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, some of them ferment only hexoses. Some of them ferment only pep, uh, pentoses. Some lactobacilli produce lactate. Other lactobacilli consume lactate. Uh, and you find them in a very different ecosystem, which means if I tell you I'm working on lactobacillus, you don't know squat, uh, you know that it's a, it's a fermentative lactic acid producing organism, but that's about as much as you know, uh, and it's difficult to communicate. Uh, in discussions, uh, we were 
you know, some colleagues said, you know, you can use the species name to give you a little bit more precise indication of uh, what the species actually is. Uh, there is correct for the two or three dozen commercially important species. It's not correct for the um, entire genus because there are simply too many. Uh, what I have here is a list of how many, eight species, and I just picked randomly all species that start with H uh, and are named after a place, which means a city or a country or a region. Uh, and <clears throat> even after uh, spending uh, the better part of the last year with reading the species new descriptions and figure out which one is which, uh, I cannot tell you for all of those uh, in which metabolic, ecological, and phylogenetic group it is, so I would need to look the names up because I can't tell them apart. Uh, the confusion extends to uh, the regulatory assessment of lactobacilli. Uh, this is taken from an EFSA paper published in 2018 uh, to give guidance on antibiotic resistance of lactobacilli, and because lactobacilli are, contains very different species, uh, you also need to assess their antibiotic resistance in a different way. Uh, and you know, if you take this in the light of the current taxonomy, uh, it sort of makes sense. Not all of it makes sense. Uh, so EFSA is trying to do the right thing, uh, but they don't quite get there because they are lacking the terminology to say, uh, uh, give a name to the uh, what, what they used to call obligate heterofermentative organisms or uh, the Lactiplantipasodos plantarum group. Uh, so we need taxonomy to actually describe which group of organisms uh, they mean, because if we say lactobacillus in the old sense, uh, we mean a group of organisms that is so diverse uh, that using the same genus name uh, doesn't make too much sense. Why is the was the lactobacillus taxonomy so difficult until recently? Uh, essentially, since we used 6NS rRNA gene sequences, it has become, in the early 90s, uh, it has become very obvious that the genus is too diverse to group all of the organisms into a, a single genus. So when I started science, uh, and you know, I've done that some time ago, uh, it was already obvious that uh, the genus is, is more diverse than a bacterial genus should be. Uh, the problem is that the, if you use a single gene to elucidate the phylogenetic relationships of organisms, your resolution is not sufficient to figure out how different groups relate to each other. Uh, the lactobacilli have been grouped uh, in specific phylogenetic groups. Uh, that was fairly consistent uh, after 2006. I think the first paper came out, uh, but it was impossible with 16S rRNA to tell how these groups relate to uh, each other. Uh, and you need that knowledge to do the taxonomy proper. Uh, that has changed uh, in 2015 uh, when the genome sequences of most type strains uh, became available. There was a large sequencing project uh, in China. Uh, two papers used that genome set uh, to get to the core genome phylogeny of lactobacilli. Uh, and since these two papers now, it has been possible to say how different groups of lactobacilli relate to each other and to other lactic acid bacteria. Uh, the problem is now you still need to find some tool to divide them up uh, in specific groups. Uh, two papers proposed to split them up into 24 groups, uh, which were largely consistent with um, uh, what was done earlier with 6NS rRNA phylogeny. Uh, others, uh, this is an Australian group which looked across all of the bacterial taxonomy. Uh, they suggested 16 groups, uh, and another paper published in 2018 used 14 groups. Uh, and each of these proposals made sense, was reasonable, but lacked the legitimacy and recognition uh, that is provided by a formal taxonomic reclassification. Uh, because if you would use a group name, you also would need to always say, you know, I'm using this group or this proposal and not the other. Uh, so it's too difficult. And at the latest in 2018, uh, the lactobacillus taxonomy became a stack of dirty dishes. 
everyone knew that somebody should do it. Anyone could have done it, but nobody did it. This changed in 2015, uh, and uh, I'm not going to tell the story uh, how the group uh, got together. Uh, there were fortunately a couple of people which had good contacts across the continent uh, and across different disciplines. Uh, what is important is that it took a large group. Uh, and if I go left to right, um, you have at the left the uh, bioinformatic wizards, uh, which did all the high level computing that you need for the uh, trees and the genomic markers uh, for relatedness. Uh, we had many people on board uh, which know lactobacillus, its ecology, physiology, and the history of the taxonomy very well, uh, which was important because we made ecology and metabolism an important criterion. Uh, and last but not least, we had a couple of people that know the ins and out of the formal aspect of taxonomy, which became very important. Knowing about the economic importance of uh, lactobacilli, uh, we also made sure that we consult with stakeholders uh, during the process to make sure that we get the taxonomy right and the names right. So throughout the process of getting the paper together, which took about one year, uh, we consulted with uh, producers of starter cultures with uh, the ISAP uh, and with the International Probiotic Association uh, to give people a heads up of what's coming and to also know where the pressure points are for industry. Uh, this is the result. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but uh, I have the digital object uh, uh, identifier uh, on later slides, uh, including an open access DOI, which is available through our university library. Uh, I call it the lactobacillus monster. It turned out to have 77 printed pages. So it was, it's a little bit longer than your average uh, experimental paper. Uh, one thing that we had to do was to meet that criteria for the delineation of novel genera. Uh, since the genomic age, which started at some point of time between 2010 and 2015, uh, the criteria for species level taxonomy were very well described. Uh, but for the genus level taxonomy, that was still a little bit of muddy water. Uh, and I think scientists are still trying to figure out their way at which level of difference um, you call something a new genus and which numerical values you use to make the call. Uh, but we decided, of course, that the novel genera should be monophyletic. So the phylogenetic tree is important. Uh, we use the uh, minor acid identity of the core genome as a numerical marker for relatedness uh, and you cannot completely avoid overlap so there is no hard cutoff uh, but we wanted to have limited overlap between intragenous and intergenous values. Uh, the third piece is important, and that was close to my heart because I'm interested in ecology and physiology more than in taxonomy. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the proposed genera are also differentiated by ecology, physiology, uh, com common traits, uh, which means for most or all of the new genera, it is possible to say three words uh, which describe why species in this genus are metabolically and ecologically different from species in other genera. Uh, it's not possible for all of them because in some cases we just have too little information on what the organisms are and what they do. And last but not least, uh, we wanted to be largely consistent with all the previous work that was done uh, and made very good suggestions on how to split them up. We crunched a lot of numbers uh, and the reason uh, that this takes some time is because the tree is rather big. Uh, this is the phylogenetic tree, which includes all lactobacilli with genome sequence data that has been available in August, I think was the last time we updated the figure for the paper. Uh, I will not go into too much detail, but I want to highlight two pieces. Uh, the first piece is for many, not for all, but for many species, you know their habitat. And habitat and source of isolation is a different story. Uh, many of them have been isolated from food. 
but for some genera, where or not they come from, they're adapted to vertebrate hosts, for example, everything which is now lactobacillus species and which used to be um, lactobacillus and rookie group, they are in the intestine of vertebrates or in insects. That may be a little bit counterintuitive because most of you know that, for example, Lactobacillus aldebrucii subspecies, Bulgaricus, uh, really is the most uh, dominant or one of two dominant organisms in yogurt fermentation. Uh, if you look a little bit more closely, you also find the organism very regularly uh, in the intestine of suckling piglets, of suckling calves, and possibly in the intestine of um, other uh, suckling mammals. So it's just as much uh, an intestinal organism as all others in the genus. It just has specialized to a specific age group. Um, you see also for the other genera, in many cases, the color coding here on the branches, there is my mouse here, the color coding on the branches, which indicates the genera which were established in April matches to the color coding of the outer ring, uh, which means there is a substantial overlap of taxonomy and ecology. And you now know if I say I have a Limosi lactobacillus, uh, that's the former L. ruteri group, which is down here. Uh, I'm talking about organisms which occur almost exclusively in the intestinal tract of vertebrates. The second piece I want to highlight is the fermentation pattern. Uh, until 2015, we set differentiated lactic acid bacteria into obligate homofermenters, facultative heterofermenters, and obligate heterofermenters. Uh, and there was no rhyme or reason to this uh, classification because in many cases, uh, you find strains with different fermentation times, uh, types in the same species. So there was absolutely no relationship of metabolism and phylogeny or taxonomy, you couldn't make sense of it. Uh, if you look at what's happening now, uh, the first piece, if you start separating lactics into homofermentative and heterofermentative, you see homofermentative is everything which metabolizes glucose by glycolysis. Heterofermentative is everything that metabolizes pentose by uh, the pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, you get a clear separation, everything on the tree between 11 o'clock and there is lacti planti bacillus here. Uh, between 11 o'clock and 5.30, all of them are homofermenters. Uh, and starting at 5.30 with furfuri lactobacillus, which is here, all of these are heterofermenters. Uh, which means if you bother to remember any of the new genus names, you know the fermentation type, homofermentative or heterofermentative, which in my experience has big repercussions on metabolism. So, if you look at the details, what has been in the Lactobacillus say in March 2020 are assigned to new 26 new genera. Uh, three of these uh, retained old names, that is Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, and Paralactobacillus. Uh, for 23 genera, we had to find new names. Uh, and the oldest and one of the biggest groups in the, in the, of the Lactobacilli, uh, the Lactobacillus Zabruchii group, retains the genus name Lactobacillus, which also happens to include many important uh, food cultures, particularly used in cereal and dairy fermentations. takes a little bit. We try to make sure that the names mean something. Uh, and I have to wait because I want to get to the next slide, which is here. Uh, this is a translation of the new genus names. Uh, I will not go to, to, uh, through all of them. Uh, but for example, we have two genera of organisms which are fairly strictly associated with bees or flower. Uh, they now have the name Bombylactobacillus and Apilactobacillus, standing for bee and bumblebee lactobacilli, uh, which may not be too difficult to remember. Uh, we have here a Licori lactobacillus. Uh, these are organisms closely related to the former Lactobacillus mali. These are all organisms which happen to live in liquid habitats, plant associated. Uh, in food, they're relevant in water kefir formation and I think also in kombucha fermentation. All of these organisms are biofilm forming. Many of them are motile. Uh, many of them have the exceptional property of degrading extracellular fructans. Uh, so again, there is a 
joint descriptor, a common descriptor for all species in the genus, uh, and we try to capture some of that in the name. Uh, on the other side, the blue ones here, these, these are the heterofermenters. Uh, one example here is Lenti lactobacillus, uh, which translates to slow lactobacilli. Uh, why did we want to call them slow? Uh, Lenti lactobacillus, which includes the former lactobacillus bucneri, uh, these are the, most of these organisms are capable of converting lactic acid to acetic acid and propane diol. Uh, and these are often the organisms which grow slowly after other lactobacilli uh, have used up all the hexoses. Uh, and they are often the troublemakers in, uh, in uh, alcoholic fermentations because they start to spoil the product uh, also in pickles, in silage, they're more uh, beneficial. Uh, same applies for secundi lactobacillus. This is the former lactobacillus colinoides group. Why do we call them second lactobacilli uh, comparable to the lenti lactobacilli? They grow after yeast and other lactic acid bacteria have already grown. Uh, many of them, for example, don't use hexoses at all because by the time they start to grow, everything that's left is pentoses uh, and other organisms. I won't go through all the list. I have a link later on where you can recover these names. Um, what we try to do in the manuscript, uh, we try to document the name changes throughout the last 70 years, I think. Uh, we don't go back to the early 20th century, uh, but most or all of the species names that were used in conjunction with lactobacillus, uh, you find mentioned in the paper. Uh, so you can look up what the name is called now. And if you don't want to navigate a 77 page lactobacillus monster, uh, you can use the two websites, which we will keep current to sort of translate old name to new name. Uh, and it's now been a little bit more than six months after the paper was published. Uh, but there has been substantial update. Uh, strain collections uh, include the new names. NCBI includes the new names. Uh, the genome-based taxonomy database used the names, uh, and EFSA uh, for now decided to use all the new names in parallel to ease the transition. Uh, I'm not sure what the position of the FDA is. Uh, to get new species or isolates assigned to the genus level, uh, 6NS rRNA gene similarity still allows a robust assignment of a new species to any of the new genera. Uh, if, if that's not enough, uh, you may have to start thinking of doing genome-based work uh, because it might be a new species or even a new genus. As far as I'm concerned, the new taxonomy or the current taxonomy makes it a lot easier to communicate. Uh, if I tell you now that I'm working on lactobacillus, you know I'm working on vertebrate host adapted organisms which are homofermentative, all of them. Uh, they are vancomycin sensitive, which differentiates them from most other lactobacilli, uh, and they don't use pyruvate formate lyase in their metabolism, which differentiates them from most other homofermentative lactobacillus. Lactobacillus produces lactate, lenti lactobacillus species consume lactate. Uh, so, again, uh, you have the name associated with a speci specific metabolic trait or a lack thereof. Uh, these are the two. B and bumblebee associated organisms, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you look for biofilm farmers, uh, they're almost all found in only two genera. Uh, I mentioned Licori lactobacillus, which is the uh, one occurring in liquid habitats, plant associated or sucrose is available. Uh, a second genus for almost all species or strains are biofilm forming is uh, Limosi lactobacillus adequately termed slimy lactobacillus. So limosi means slimy. Uh, this is the former lactobacillus ruderi group. Uh, and all of these organisms form biofilms in the upper intestine of animals. If you look for organisms which occur in the gut, uh, they all come from, well, that's the vertebrate gut, I must specify. Uh, we have three genera which are associated with insects. Uh, and we have three genera which are associated with uh, vertebrates, that's lactobacillus, uh, Ligi lactobacillus, and Limosi lactobacillus. 
species from other genera may temporarily persist in the intestine, but they're not true, true colonizers and autochthons. What does that mean? Uh, if you're interested in probiotics, uh, you don't have to know, remember more than three different genus name. Uh, many of the probiotics come from the vertebrate host adapted lactobacilli, that's lactobacillus, Ligi lactobacillus, which includes L. salivarius, and Limosi lactobacillus, which includes L. ruteri and L. fermentum. Uh, most probiotics are derived from these three genera. Uh, then we have Lacticasei bacillus and Lactiplanti bacillus. Uh, these are nomadic species. So they really do well in plants, but they also can temporarily persist in, in um, the intestine of insects or of animals. Uh, so these also include uh, probiotic species and everything else is pretty much everything else. Uh, there is a lot of proposals to use other species from other genera as a probiotic. Uh, but if you look for commercially available products with actually clinical health uh, trials to back up the health benefit, uh, these five species are all you need to know. In the lactobacilli, not the, there are also the streptococcaceae and the and the bifidobacteria. Uh, if you look at cheese, uh, the picture also simplifies. Um, you have lactobacillus and streptococcus species, which are used in thermophilic starter cultures. Uh, if you add the non-starter lactic acid bacteria, you have to Get a few more Lacticasia bacillus, Lacticlanti bacillus, Ligi lactobacillus, which includes L. salivarius, uh, and Limosi lactobacillus, which includes L. ruteri and fermentum. Uh, they are the major representative of non starter lactics. Uh, so, again, the total is, is six genus names to remember. Uh, if you're unfortunate to produce in Quebec, there and in other places where it's a little bit colder, uh, there are species from a few other genera occurring. But by and large, you can get it down to no more than a handful of genera, which play a role. Uh, here is the next tree. Uh, that usually takes a while. Uh, you can play this game for other fermentations as well. Uh, here is pretty much the same tree that I had earlier, a little bit updated because we include the Lucura stocks and Vesala and added the species a few species, but uh, what I want to point out here is the annotation on the outer ring. Uh, this is liquid milk products, cheese starter culture, non starter lactic acid bacteria. The yellow ones are the probiotics, and then the outer ones here uh, that's the spoilage organisms. Uh, for each of these five broad categories, uh, you will find the good or the bad organisms clustered uh, at very few areas of the tree, uh, meaning they're clustered in uh, very few of the new genera. For example, if you look at spoilage of cheese, uh, you're here with uh, Leuve lactobacillus coriniformis. Here is a troublemaker, uh, Pokey lactobacillus batachensis, former uh, uh, Hokkaidensis group. Uh, and then here the lentil lactobacilli also cause spoilage. Uh, for the same reason, they're good at growing slowly with lactic acid as a carbon source. I could continue a little bit longer, uh, but I won't uh, because I want to. Uh, I want to get uh, to the uh, questions, conclusions and questions. Uh, two more slides on why current nomenclature makes communication easier would be safety. Uh, we knew that few species of lactobacilli can cause rare, uh, but not undangerous or not severe uh, infections. Uh, if you look at which the troublemakers are for the most part, uh, that was L. rhamnosus. Uh, and most of the troublemakers are now in the uh, genus Lacticasia abacillus. Um, for all the other new genera, there is no or virtually no description of any systemic infections. 
Uh, and the infections with lacticasia epistolis rhamnosus are so rare, uh, and you need to have such a critical illness before you get infected, uh, that most public health agencies nevertheless consider this uh, organism safe. Uh, there is one genus in the, in the family, which is the genus Vaisala, uh, which I would tend to think that the infections are as rare as those with Lacticasia ibicillus. Uh, but since Vaisala is not commercially as important, uh, it wasn't analyzed and discussed as carefully as Elramosis. Uh, the same goes for the antibiotic resistance. Uh, you find a couple of examples where resistance patterns matches the current taxonomy. Uh, these are the three genera in the Lactobacillaceae which are vancomycin sensitive. All others are intrinsically vancomycin resistant. How and why does that relate to taxonomy? Uh, because the vancomycin resistance is mediated by the structure of the cell wall, uh, which links to taxonomy. Uh, if you look at mobile or at antibiotic resistance genes, which is encoded by uh, mobile genetic elements, uh, you find some genes which occur almost exclusively in intestinal lactobacilli. Uh, one example is the tetracycline gene uh, TETW, uh, which you will find quite frequently in intestinal organisms other than lactobacillus, uh, but that means the three intestinal adapted uh, genera, lactobacillus, Ligi lactobacillus, and Limosi lactobacillus. They pick up the gene quite frequently because they live in co close contact with the other bacteria that have TEDW. Other lactobacilli almost never carry that gene because they never get in contact long enough or close enough to uh, facilitate lateral gene transfer. Moving forward, uh, it is my impression and some level of excitement uh, that with the names that we have, with the tools to actually give different organisms a different name, uh, we can ask questions that we couldn't ask before because we were simply lacking the terminology to talk to each other. Uh, for example, if you take your host adapted genera and your nomadic uh, genera, uh, lactobacillus and limosi lactobacillus on the one hand, lactiplantibacillus and lacticasi ibacillus on the other hand, both are used as probiotics, both interact with the immune system, but uh, there is some indication that the host adapted genera actually have a different way of interacting with their hosts than the nomadic organisms. Uh, if you look carefully, there is some indication that the intestinal lactobacilli share specific acid resistance genes, uh, which is important if you want to get an organism past the stomach barrier, or if you want to use it in a long-term uh, sour cereal mesh. Um, this is a question which I'm still puzzled about. Uh, we have two genera which produce taste-active gamma glutamyl peptides. Uh, they're involved in Kokomi activity, so they're not taste compounds, but they're enhancers of other tastes. I have no clue. Uh, I have no clue why these peptides are produced mainly by, by two genera, but uh, we're working to find that out. Uh, and last but not least, we have now essentially two genera, which frequently include strains that convert lactic acid to propane diol and then on to propionic acid. Uh, so we can ask, uh, can we use that for food preservation, uh, something which was rarely attempted in the past because the pathway is a little bit cryptic. Uh, I will not comment this. Uh, these are websites uh, that you might find useful. Uh, the first two translate the genus names and give you access to uh, the papers which describe the species, uh, the genome accession numbers, uh, and a few other things. Uh, and we will keep that updated with the new species as they are published. Uh, this is the link to the paper, one the journal website, the other one the open access uh, DOI. Uh, and these are two uh, links that I maintain on my personal website. Uh, one is the link to the phylogenetic tree and the names, and the second one uh, to my periodic table of fermented foods, which I will not discuss today. Uh, with that, my conclusion, Lactobacillus has changed. I continue to use the word lactobacilli, which is a plain English word, to include everything which has been 
lactobacillus bacillus until March. Uh, so I think uh, the new taxonomy isn't necessarily a pain. Uh, it makes it easier to identify cultures, to select cultures for food applications and to regulate cultures. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. And uh, as we go to the discussion, I want to put up the slide with my collaborators again. So thanks for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Michael. This is this has been so fantastic to hear sort of the background of where this came from and and the arguments for why this really helps clarify a lot of things for us in lactobacillus. So this is awesome. Um, I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask, and then we'll open it up to some of the the questions um, from people who are listening from the attendees. Um, I actually would like to hear a little bit more about how this group got together because the origin stories are always sort of fascinating. So was this um, a problem that was fermenting, if you will, uh, for a while in the community and, and many different scientists said this is something we need to address or how did, how did everyone come together around this idea? Uh, this was, I mean, this has been fermenting for a while. Uh, and since I was part of the 2015 and 17 papers, uh, at that time I was hesitant to do it. First, because I expected it to be a shitload of work, which it actually was. Uh, and second, because I thought that the word lactobacillus is not only a Latin genus name, but also a word in English, German, French, Italian, plain language. As a scientist, I don't have jurisdiction over plain language only on the genus names. Uh, but it became obvious that, you know, if the taxonomy is what it is, the people will not use group names or designations, they will still write lactobacillus. Uh, then you get a sequencing project where people tell you, I have food fermentation X and lactobacillus genus is the dominant organisms. Okay, thank you, that's not helpful. Um, what happened is there was the 2018 paper uh, from the Australian group, which we sort of ignored. Uh, and then came a 2018 paper from Janamana Felis with Elisa Salvetti and, and Paul O'Toole. Uh, and I've seen that paper and I thought it's not the best of all possible ways to do the lactobacillus taxonomy, uh, but I left it at that. Uh, and then Sarah Lebert published a comment on that paper, also writing that this is not the best, you can do it. Uh, and after that, uh, my friend and collaborator, Jens Walter, he knew Sarah, he knew Paul O'Toole. Uh, so he traveled and talked to both. And that was October last year when the group got together. Great. And yeah, that worked. Yeah. It's really great to see the community coming together around this, this really important problem. Um, and so I guess I have a couple questions. If I'm um, an artisan, say sauerkraut producer, uh, making a, you know, small batches of sauerkraut from my local community or regionally. Uh, how does this renaming of lactobacillus impact me? Does it or, or does it really not matter for, for someone at a sort of that scale? The ones which are impacted are those that sell cultures. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you sell cultures, you have to give your organism the proper name. And now, uh, you know, lactobacillus salivarius is no longer lactobacillus salivarius, but um, Ligi lactobacillus salivarius. If you're producing traditional fermented foods that include sauerkraut, that includes other traditional fermented foods, you don't label the organism, so you don't you don't have to do anything. Uh, it may matter to you that what you know if you make sauerkraut, you're almost invariably using lactiplantibacillus plantarum and Levi lactobacillus brevis that turn out to be the dominant fermentation organisms after. Uh, four weeks. There are a couple of people in the audience that can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, and they have a different genus name, but for somebody who doesn't buy and sell cultures, uh, this doesn't change. Okay. And have you heard any responses? I, you've clearly been talking to the scientific community and folks who work on lactic acid bacteria and taxonomy. Have you talked to anyone in industry and, and sort of what is their response? Will they be adopting these new names and, and how soon might we see these names on probiotic bottles or on, on cultures that people are buying? I don't know how fast that will take until you see the new names on the label. Actually, I didn't check. Uh, in the process, in the process, we had close contact with European Food and F European Association of Food and Feed Cultures. Uh, 
cultural producers. Uh, and because most of the big starter cultural companies are in Europe, that includes, I think, probably 70, 80% of the global market. So they knew what was coming and they provided input. Uh, I also did a straw poll with the three, four companies I, I work with. How fast that makes it on the label depends a little bit on the how fast the regulatory agencies move. Uh, I know that EFSA and Health Canada, uh, they have a grace period of, of probably a couple of years where both names are used in parallel. Uh, and at some point of time that will shift to using only one of the two. Uh, so I think there will be a transition period until everyone's familiar with the names and putting them on the label. Most or virtually all cultures that are used commercially can be still abbreviated with L. So your Ligi Lactobacillus salivarius is still L. salivarius. That's still a possible way to, to use the acronym. Great. Uh, just out of sort of curiosity, I, I love that phylogenetic tree. I think it's great that you provided the link for us to download it. It would be an awesome gift for uh, a holiday gift for a friend who's an a lactic acid bacterial nerd okay. as a poster. Um, what I find really fascinating in the tree is how many lactic acid bacteria we don't know where they come from, right? We, we really don't have a good sense of their origin. There's just a lot of sort of gaps in that information. Do you think that this sort of reorganization and, and linking the ecology with the phylogenetic tree will help us start to figure out where these things come from, what the reservoir might be? I would, I would think yes, uh, first, because we know that the reservoir is actually, for the most part, uh, for a good chunk, it's related to a, to a genus. Uh, for example, many of many or most of the new description in 2019 and 2020, uh, they come from fermented vegetables, pickles. Uh, and as you have shown, these organisms are likely to come from plants. Uh, whether that's their reservoir or whether it's insect or soil, we don't know, but now we know where we can, you know, where we have to look. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we have a, we are humans, so we are biased to look at things that matter to humans. Uh, what we have a lot isolated, we have a lot of food isolates. We have isolates from domestic animals, including bees, and we have uh, isolates from food domestic animals, uh, and that's about it. Uh, but if you look at all the wild animals, uh, I suspect if you start a more significant sampling of wild animals, including insects, uh, possibly plants which are not used for food, uh, you will find that there is a lot of diversity out there which we don't know. And this will be a great framework to sort of plug in that new diversity. As we discover those species yeah. and try to characterize it, it'll be a much cleaner uh, portrait to stick them into, which will be, which will be amazing. Um, I guess another question I have before we break into some of the questions coming in on the chat is, has this been done for another economically important group of microbes? Like, has this sort of renaming and reclassification ever been done before? And and has it been adopted and has it sort of been assimilated into the, the industry where it was used? Or is this sort of the biggest reclassification for a, an economically important microbe? Uh, I think it's the biggest reclassification since the 1990s. Okay. Uh, if you go back a far, you know, a long history in time, uh, in the 90, 80s and 90s, you had uh, streptococcus split up in, in enterococcus, lactococcus, and streptococcus, and then you had uh, tetragenococcus split up from pediococcus. Uh, so these were the things that you could do with the 16S genes because they would tell you that they're different. Lactobacillus wasn't touched because the 16S wasn't good enough to tell how you would put them apart. Uh, if you ask somebody who's been studying uh, in this millennium, uh, what is the Streptococcus faecalis? Uh, they will give you a blank stare because they don't know the name anymore. Uh, and I think that transition probably took that transition probably took five to ten years. Uh, the old names lingered around longest uh, in the in the books for the traits because your Streptococcus lactis was also in the in the uh, in the trade aggregation for people that are making cheese. Uh, but now it's just. It is one of this, and I think with the Lactobacillus taxonomy, we'll get to the same point in five to 10 years. Uh, and somebody writes 10 years ago about Lactobacillus plantarum, you know that he or she didn't quite look at the literature, it may not be very normal. Great, right. all right, Michael, are you ready for some questions from the audience? I'm ready for questions, yes. Great, all right. So. 
Uh, first, this one is from Alex Lewin. He's an author of multiple books on fermentation. He asks, this is directed to both uh, Michael and Ben. There is an idea in the fermentation community that colonies of microbes evolve in meaningful short time frames, whether it's due to selective pressure or due to assimilation of exogenous genetic material. Uh, what are bo both of you, what are your thoughts on that? You want me to start, Ben? I know you have a, uh, I can, if you look at the fermentations, the fungi that we use in many fermentations, including Saccharomyces, uh, Aspergillus, Koji, uh, Aspergillus aurisae, which is used in Koji and uh, Penicillium roquefortii, some of these have been domesticated. If you have a culture that has a history of backslopping over a couple of hundred years. Uh, in bacteria where you don't have sexual reproduction, you don't have diploidy, the bacteria, even the 14,000 years that we have since we started food fermentations, is not quite long enough for a different species uh, to evolve, uh, which means in the food fermentations, we select a subset of organisms that really have their habitat in a in a different ecosystem. Uh, for the spontaneous fermentations, uh, they all come from plants. Uh, for many of the backslop fermentations, they come from the intestine, which is why your uh, cheese starter cultures are often recruited. The thermophilic ones are exclusively recruited from host adapted lactobacilli. So here it's dispersal. Dispersal do the organisms get to your food fermentation and selection. Uh, how do you control your fermentation conditions to select for the right organisms? These two are the biggest players. And the acquisition of genes occurs, but it's really only a minor footnote and not the big, the big piece. Uh, with that, I will maybe hand over to Ben because I know that he's done work in this area as well. Uh, yeah, I would agree with Michael that it's a much longer term process. It doesn't you know, happen in one batch of sauerkraut or even multiple batches of sauerkraut. You may start to see some mutations over making sauerkraut for you know, several years in a facility if that same strain and that same species sticks around for a long period of time. But even then, the, the number of mutations and their effect on the biology of the organism may not be huge. It may be neutral variation that doesn't actually affect the biology. Um, that said, I think over much longer periods of time, um, people have domesticated some of these microbes and we can see the movement of genes across certain bacteria or even from bacteria to fungi. Um, and in terms of Michael's talk and, and sort of this reorganization of this taxonomy of lactobacillus, that's sort of going on in the background, but it's not going to play a huge role in the, in the trees that Michael is presenting today. Um, he's really thinking about core genes that um, wouldn't necessarily be horizontally transferred or, or evolve very quickly. Um, so, but yeah, it's a great question, Alex. Thank you for that. Uh, so... Fred Bright, who I know you guys both know, a microbiologist with the USDA, he asked, the question of distinguishing uh, genera and species is always difficult for bacteria where the genomes can be more of a blended spectrum rather than discrete groups. Could you give us your view of the best practices for these genus and species distinctions? Well, they, you can actually, the, in, the new, in the current taxonomy, you can go back to biochemical tests to, to identify organisms. If, a, if an organism is thermophilic and mycomycin sensitive, uh, you have a 99% risk that it's a lactobacillus. Uh, if, it, if an organism is thermophilic, heterofermentative, and produces uh, exopolysaccharides from glucose, you have as high a possibility, 99%, that it's a limosi lactobacillus. Uh, the core genome and the 16S give you unambiguous information on the genus level. So everything that you do with the 16S sequences, you don't always get identification at the species level, even with a full length, but you always end up in the right genus or with the information that maybe you have to look at getting a new genus when things become a little bit more complicated. And if you look at the tree that I presented, I mean, there have been, there have been probably by now, at least a dozen versions been published uh, by different groups with different sets of core genes, uh, with a different selection of genomes and organisms, but the grouping is so consistent and so rock solid uh, that I don't think that there will be a confusion by you know, anything. You know, that's the core genome and that's how the organisms relate to each other. Uh, if you compare lactobacillus, for example, to Enterobacteriaceae, 
the proportion of the genome which is acquired by lateral gene transfer is much smaller than the uh, than in lactobacillus than in enterobacteraceae. So the impact of lateral gene transfer on niche adaptation is much smaller. It's detectable, but it's much smaller. So we had another question about uh, lactic acid bacteria. Um, someone asked, how will the classification pair with the term lactic acid bacteria, which essentially is, is said <clears throat> to include anything that produces lactic acid as a common feature? Uh, the, the word lactic acid bacteria remains unchanged. Again, that's not a taxonomic name. That's a, that's a trivial name. Uh, if I say lactic acid bacteria, I mean everything that is in the bacterial order uh, lactobacillalis, to include streptococci, enterococci, uh, carnobacterium, and a few others. Uh, I think most people use it in a comparable meaning, but that's not strictly defined. Uh, what I tend to do, and I think it's useful, I'm not sure what, what, whether other will follow, I call, I call everything that was a lactobacillus until March, I still call it lactobacilli, uh, which means if I write not lactobacillus species, italicized, capitalized to refer to the genus name, if I say lactobacilli are, are wonderful, I mean everything which has been in the genus until recently. Uh, but that's something we will see how the terminology evolves. Uh, and for the trivial names, you know, it's not so much of a problem if different people use the terminology a little bit different. All right, so my last question for you, Michael, what do you wish the general public knew about lactobacillus? Oh. <laughs> I think I would put that in the context of, of fermented food. Um, if, you go, if you go to the supermarket uh, and you look for food that is tasty or for food that is healthy, uh, you will find that you have to pick very different foods from very different sections of the supermarket. Uh, and the one place where health benefits and very high quality likely fall together is the fermented food section. Not all of them, but many of them. So that would be lactobacillus, wonderful organisms, uh, because they allow us uh, to make good food and some of us allow us to stay healthy. And that's now the lactobacillus, the lactobacillus I use as an English word, not as, a, not as a taxonomic term. Thank you so much, Michael and Ben, for sharing your expertise today. And thank you for all of you for attending today's webinar. Uh, we, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, including the State of the Art of Cider Making, making with Kirsten and Christopher Shockey and Fermented Foods Trends with Spins Market Data. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and to register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for giving the opportunity. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Bye. <laughs>